Hello, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm uh, going to talk about Europeana, a little bit first about me for, um, it was, I think, just told in Korean, but for the English speakers, I'm um, Paul Keller. I run a think tank called Kennisland in Amsterdam, and um, Kennisland is the Dutch partner of Creative Commons, so we run, we are the public project lead of Creative Commons in the Netherlands, and we also um, work very closely with Europeana. Europeana is the European portal for digitized cultural heritage. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we worked over the last seven, eight years with Europeana in order to develop a strategy that promotes openness and that really puts openness at the core of what Europeana is doing. Um, so first couple of things. So this is the website of Europeana. Europeana is a, a digital effort. It's run by a foundation which is in The Hague, has a staff of about 50 people there. Um, and um, it chiefly operates this website, which is intended to provide access to the digitized collections of cultural heritage institutions, so museums, archives, libraries, from all across Europe. At the moment, Europeana has about 45 million digital objects in it, so you can find information about 45 million books, paintings, videos, audio recordings, some 3D objects in there. Um, and these 45 million objects come from about 3,500 different institutions all across Europe. So that's coming from large national libraries, large museums, but like also smaller um, regional museums or regional archives, small libraries. Um, Europeana has a aggregation structure where we work with aggregators, which really try to give institutions all across Europe the opportunity to put their collections into Europeana and make them findable across all of the European Union, but also across the rest of the world because it's online. So um, Europeana, as you can see on this website, primarily lets you search these collections. And if you search, and I've uh, um, here um, did a search for Seoul, and uh, we get a lot of pictures uh, for some reason from Dutch participants in the Olympic Games in Seoul from uh, 1988. Um, is um, so out of these 45 million uh, objects, you get about 1,500 uh, for this search term. And the really interesting thing is what Europeana um, is, is, is starting to do. It's not only about finding this material, we want people to reuse this material. And um, so Europeana um, labels the copyright status of all things, and based on that copyright status, we actually um, allow people to filter on the reuse status. If you look in the bottom left corner of the left comment of there, there's this question, can I use it? And we have um, categories, yes, with attribution, yes, with restrictions, and only with permission. So only with permission is stuff that is covered, fully covered by copyright. And the other ones, yes, with attribution, is, is really free and open content. That's content that meets all the requirements that Cable just explained for inclusion and open educational resources could be used on Wikipedia. And yes, with restrictions is content on, under, under, your, uh, under Creative Commons licenses, which have some restrictions such as non-commercial or no derivative works. Um, so if you select yes with attribution, you end up with, uh, in this case, 88 works from a bunch of different institutions which deal with Seoul here. And um, so how did we get here? Or why did Europeana, how, um, how did Europeana get here where it's really um, promoting openness as a part, as an institution? It's not like the, 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 the original brief given to Europeana when it was set up was just to provide access to Europe's cultural heritage, not so much about enabling reuse. That is something that has developed over the last seven years. Um, oh yeah, one thing I forgot, um, Europeana also has a Korean partner. We have a memorandum of understanding with the Korean Copyright Commission, and the Korean Copyright Commission, or an organization working with them, I'm not entirely sure, has provided, uh, um, has provided um, a Korean branded access to the entire Europeana data set. Europeana has an open API, all the data, the metadata describing um, the material in Europeana is completely open, which allows these guys to provide their own search interface in Korean for the entire Europeana database. Um, so as you see, like if you remember the search I just showed you, this is exactly the same search results you get here as you get in Europeana. That is not something Europeana has built. It is something that could be built because um, we have an open API and all the metadata that is contained in Europeana's database is free for everyone to reuse for every purpose. 
So this is actually showcasing we don't have to, I can't do this in very many countries. I think Europe, uh, Korea is the only country where we have such an effort. Um, and it's something which makes me very happy to be here and uh, to, to see it from this side. Um, so um, I usually show this slide uh, to demonstrate um, how much work we have put into an effort in Europeana to get everything rights labeled, every object in Europeana rights labeled. Um, Europeana has instituted a policy relatively early in the process of saying that each digital object which is contributed to Europeana needs to have a clear right status. And that allows us, um, but that was when there was already some content in there and we did a large campaign to actually retroactively rights label everything. So this is the red bar going down. The interesting thing I want to point out here uh, uh, today is that you go into Europeana these days, like here on the, on the rightmost column, you see that 25% of the content is actually of the objects in Europeana are in the public domain, are labeled as being in the public domain. And another 22% are available under Creative Commons licenses, which is um, quite a lot of material. If you do the math, it's about um, 22 million objects which are available in Europeana via structured data and can be, uh, can be reused based on the copyright status. Um, so the question is, or like, how do you get to a point uh, of this? It's not necessarily that all the 3,500 institutions that work with Europeana all had a strategy promoting openness and labeling material that is in the public domain as public domain and using Creative Commons licenses. Um, so Europeana built, um, realized early in the process that as an aggregator, which brings together the collections from all these uh, uh, institutions, it's in a pretty unique position because like, we can actually make up rules that affect not only individual institutions, but that affect the entire network of uh, institutions that is working with Europeana. And the first thing we discovered, and that is something we've done with Creative Commons uh, together, is the need to actually be able to say that something is in the public domain. People will, probably people who are familiar with Creative Commons, is that the public domain mark that Creative Commons has is a relatively recent legal tool that we have, and it was developed after Europeana expressed the need for such a tool. So we went to Creative Commons and said, like, so we're using your licenses for a lot of stuff, but there's one element in your licensing suit that's missing, and that is something where we can simply describe saying, like, this thing, this digital object is in the public domain. Can we work on a public domain mark that allows us to label uh, public domain works in the same way with the machine readable information, with the searchability that comes from the machine readability? Um, and can we, can we have a mark from you? Creative Commons uh, looked at Europeana and said, yes, of course, we can develop this. And so Creative Commons and Europeana launched the public domain mark, which is now used for 25% a quarter of the collection in Europeana. So that was the first building block of our strategy. If we want openness, we need to be able to describe the terms of openness. Creative Commons had done a lot of pioneering work in there, and there was this, this one particular piece missing, and um, we're very grateful that Creative Commons wanted to work with us there. Um, the next thing we did is um, we developed a, a kind of like foundational document, uh, the Europeana Public Domain Charter, in which we outlined why we think it's important that cultural heritage institutions operating in the digital domain preserve the public domain wherever possible. And there's a big um, there's big discussion still in the sector going on, which mainly centers around the question if. Um, cultural institutions should be able to claim rights over works that are in the public domain that they then digitize. So does the reproduction, the digital reproduction of a public domain work attract its own new rights or does it not? And Europeana, again, early in the process, took the position in this public domain charter, that's the main element of the public domain charter, really, to say, and you see that at the bottom point, like the fourth point there on this document, to say like that we strongly believe that a digitization of a public domain work should not attract any additional rights and what's in the public domain in analog form must remain in the public domain in digital form. Um, 
so this is a foundational policy document that we made. And then it gets really interesting with the next step. Um, that is something Kennisland and the University of Amsterdam and um, the Bibliothèque Nationale de Luxembourg, which is also the partner of Creative Commons Luxembourg, worked on together is um, we um, developed a Europeana data exchange agreement, which is basically the foundational document. If you want to become a data provider to Europeana, you have to sign this document. And it regulates a lot of things. Um, one thing is it ensures that we can publish all the metadata that we're getting under CC0, so it can be freely reused, making things like the portal I showed you possible. But the other thing is also it, it contains an obligation on data providers who are working with Europeana to label material that is in the public domain truthfully as with the public domain mark. So we've not only developed a policy, we've also got like an not necessarily enforceable is probably not a good word, but um, we've, we've also got a contract and we, we ask people to enter into a contract and if they want to work with Europeana, part of the bargain is that they do truthfully label material that is in the public domain with the public domain mark. That is something which is, of course, not as easy as making people sign a contract and then everything goes from itself. That's hard work. A lot of institutions do not necessarily completely understand uh, um, all the, the copyright-related issues issues here. Some of them are really objecting to the idea that they should give public domain materials that they have digitized away without any restrictions. Um, but we've got a tool set that allows us then to enter into discussions with them and try to convince them um, to do the right thing. Um, and um, we've, we've, we've getting more and more really high quality material into Europeana. This is an example, for example, from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. They make all their material in really high quality available under the public domain mark, um, which is something which came out of our, the conversations that we had with them about providing the material to Europeana. That made them realize the necessity to like properly rights label their content, make that machine readable. And you can say, like, um, you see a lot of stuff happening with the Rijksmuseum's material, Rijksmuseum's material um, which is really beautiful. I mean, they've got an amazing collection and it's digitized in very high quality. Um, this is an example of reuse from my, my own house. Like, so I built like a picture frame which randomly selected selects a bit of the night watch and displays it every 10 minutes, something, something else. You can build that on these open infrastructure that Europeana built, and there's many, many more examples of um, actually building stuff on top of the Europeana API. We currently have about 3,500 API keys out there, so there's 3,500 people potentially working with the API, of which 200 um, API keys are used at least on a daily basis, so that is probably corresponding with running services which build on top of Europeana at the moment. Um, let me get back now. So this is what Europeana is doing. It's basically a running, uh, running thing, and one of the one of one of the the main points of contention still is this question: Should cultural heritage institutions? if they are contributing to Europeana, but also in the wider, um, should they be allowed to restrict access to material that is in the public domain or not? And I mean, Europeana has made its position very clear in this, and I think it's, it's, it's worth emphasizing again that um, we really think that the primary purpose of cultural heritage institutions in the digital environment should be to maximize access to their collections and to maximize reuse of their collection, and that means making material available under terms that allow reuse wherever possible. Um, you hear a lot of um, uh, uh, arguments against this, which is primarily um, fear of losing control, but also sometimes also fear of losing revenue. Um, and uh, with regards to the fear of losing control about material, like we have learned and we've got many, many examples to prove that, that restricting access and reuse will not give institutions more control over the material in their collections because people will just simply get it elsewhere. They will not get it from the institutions themselves. They will find it somewhere else. It will be, uh, 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 it will be originating from, from other websites and placed in other places which are much less under control of these institutions. So instead, um, we really think, and uh, we've got lots of partners who, who can prove this, is that becoming the most attractive online source will really put you in control because then the people come to your website to see your collection and not somebody else's website. So this is something that the Rijksmuseum has learned. Many other institutions across Europe have learned this. Um, 
Also, restricting access to collections is probably not a sustainable business model. Instead, what is a sustainable business model in this environment is giving public the best possible online experience. That attracts public to your websites, that attracts possibly uh, in, in a second step public not only to your websites but to their physical sites, that shows that um, you are performing uh, on your mission, which is generally the idea of the mission of most of these institutions is to preserve and make available this material. And uh, being, to, being able to execute well on your mission is probably the most important ingredient ingredient for these public fund, publicly funded institutions to prove their relevance and to continue being uh, supported by the public, both in public opinion but also with public funds. Um, so we really think, um, uh, um, in, the, in the large arg argument you're often getting like, but if we give everything away in the public domain, um, we will not. We will not cr get credit for the work. Like we want to get credit. We want to be under control. Um, we're putting a lot of work in there, and we we think that claiming copyright over works in the public domain is not how institutions will manage to get credit for the preservation work they are doing. It is by sharing their collection as wide as possible that they get maximum credit for the work that they are doing. You need to go out there. You need to be able to be be visible on other platforms. One prime example of that is, of course, Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is really the main source of information for a lot of people these days. And if you want to get credit or if you want to, like, like if you want to stay relevant as a cultural heritage institution, it's probably a good strategy to try to get as much of your material into Wikipedia to be linked from there, to be credited from there, and to, to, to plug in into the gigantic public audience that, that Wikipedia has. Um, a couple, I've got three more minutes and I want to spend them on a related but slightly different topic. Um, Europeana, so, so, so we've got this part of the collection covered, but this is maybe 50% of our collection and probably less than 50% of all the cultural heritage material out there because this only works what we would describe, this is about public domain material. Um, we all know that copyright terms are incredibly long. Like, uh, um, if you if you add the average lifetime of a creator and then the seven life plus seventy, you're talking about like easily 150 years of protection for most of the works. A lot of stuff, which means that a lot of the works which have been created in the past century are still under copyright protection, and it is incredibly difficult for cultural heritage institutions to clear the rights in their collections, often because these are non out of commerce works, these are works which are not actively managed by their creators anymore. Think about collections like uh, a, a poster collection of a museum like the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, they have an amazing poster collection, um, generally, like the, the 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 designers of posters are not credited on these posters. Often, like they are only credited to a source of a particular social movement, or they are advocating some cultural event to that institution. So it's incredibly difficult to digitize a poster collection and get copyright permission for that, because like there's nobody who has an interest in licensing the use of this, because it's economically not valuable anymore. Copyright presupposes that you um, need to obtain permission from the original creator or from the rights holders before you can digitize and make something available online. And that is where a lot of the institutions in our network, basically all of them, are struggling with getting 20th century material online. Europeana calls that the 20th century black hole. If we look at the distribution of our data, uh, of, of the works in Europeana across the time, you see like there's more and more as you approach the 18th, 19th century, and then in the 20th century it suddenly drops and there's very few materials from the 20th century currently available in Europeana. Very similar situations in other countries and other aggregators. Um, so what is Europeana doing here? Um, we've, we've become over the last one or two years um, very active in trying to influence the copyright rules in, in the European Union. That's the, the place where Europeana is, is operating and where like uh, probably 95% of our contributors are based in the European Union. Um, and so we're making the argument that we need better copyright rules that make it easier for cultural heritage institutions to provide access to works that are in copyright but out of commerce. Um, we currently don't have such rules in Europe, um, but um, the European Commission, which is the 
the, the executive of, of the European Union, is currently um, or has announced that they will review the EU copyright um, rules. And as part of that, Europeana is making an argument that the exceptions and limitations that are in there, which benefit public institutions, which allow them to make copies in certain special cases, and which also allow them to show digital copies on their own premises, on dedicated terminals, that these need to be improved. And we're lobbying very hard at the moment for um, the ability for these institutions to provide online access to materials which are in copyright but out of commerce. Um, that is something which will not feed into like the, 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 the big pool of shareable, reusable material, but we still think there is a, uh, a overarching value um, of also making this material available, accessible for individuals, for teachers, for students to look at, um, for researchers to consult online. And um, I think that is our hope that um, we'll make some progress there. We'll see an announcement from the European Union if they do something on this towards the end of the year, beginning of next year. And that's still a lot of work for us ahead. And um, that's, I think, brings my presentation to the end. Thank you very much for your attention.